É a segunda edição das nossas conferências de seminário Design de Ambientes. Vamos ter o Fabrício Cocciarella, is it right? Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, que vem de Manchester School of Arts, que é uma das escolas nossas parceiras na, no Erasmus. Ele vai fazer, o Fabrício vai fazer uma apresentação do seu trabalho e também do trabalho da escola. Is it right? You're going to do a, a presentation on your work and also on the work of the school. Yeah, yeah it's going to be a mix of both. Um, yeah. As inscrições de Erasmus uh, ainda estão uh, válidas. Não temos ninguém inscrito para a escola de Manchester, que é uma escola fantástica, para o segundo semestre do próximo ano. Okay, portanto, isto serve também para fazer aqui um bocadinho de publicidade. Uh, queria fazer um agradecimento especial à professora Célia Gomes, Bom, assim fica gravado, uh, pela organização de, destes seminários. E vamos dar uh, início à sessão com o Fabrício. Thanks for joining us. Great. Uh, you have, oh, you I've are wired. Microphone. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Great, okay. Um, so I'm going to speak in English, so good English practice for you all. I haven't a clue what Miguel just said, so I hope it was, <laughs> hope it was nice. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk, okay, a little bit about myself and my work, um, how I got into teaching about six years ago, um, and also a little bit about the course at Manchester. Some of you might be interested in doing an Erasmus exchange um, to Manchester, so I'll tell you a little bit about interior design, but also three-dimensional design, which is a little bit like your industrial design and your product course. Um, and then I'll also talk to you about particular projects that we're doing at the moment um, with other institutions too, which could be interesting for the future. So, to just a little bit about my background. So, I studied three-dimensional design, so kind of products and furniture design. And then I went on to do an MA at the Royal College of Art in design products. Um, which was really interesting because it really kind of broke down what a product is, you know, and, and how really we design experiences and design objects to kind of facilitate this understanding of the everyday world. So when I finished the Royal College, um, I found that a lot of my work, although product design, was very much about experience, and I found myself naturally starting to design environments. So I worked for this company called A. Rogers Design, you may have heard, of Abe Rogers, he's the son of Richard Rogers, um, the famous architect. And we did a lot of really interesting interiors projects, so the project top left here is Comme de Garçon in Paris, so it's a flagship store. And what was interesting about this at the time is we started to use kinetic, um, kinetic kind of programming within spaces, so the environment started to move depending on the ambience of the space, so depending on how many people were there. There was also a particular installation room where the furniture moved around, and it kind of had this haunted um, otherworldly feel to it. Um, the Tate Modern Project, the Learning Zone, was in an art gallery and it was an exhibition designed to teach people about the art exhibitions in the Tate Modern um, through cinema and through particular games that were designed, um, products that help people learn about particular events in history. Michelle Guillon at the bottom was another interactive store in Mayfair in London. Um, and it was an optician, very simply just an optician in a shop, but it had this kind of experimental eye laboratory, which was very safe, but really interesting, kind of using um, virtual reality, and um, also the space, again, was moving, um, was moving and documenting the people that were in the space. This little image down here is a shop for a company, a fashion brand, called Full Circle. Now, these, these projects, so Comme de Garçon, a fashion brand, Full Circle, a fashion brand. Um, so, so we kind, I suppose after World College, I started to get into this, this world of retail spaces, which I hadn't experienced before. And you'll see, as I kind of go through the slides, that becomes more important as kind of companies want to um, employ designers to design experiences. The Full Circle shop, um, I've just taken a photo there of the, the changing room. Now, it looks like you can see what's going on in the changing room, which is quite fun for people that come into the space. But it's actually a video projection, about an hour-long film about all these events that happen in the changing room. And it's just this idea that people might witness something they hadn't expected to witness when they go into town. 
So after doing stuff for Abe um, in the studio, I found myself getting into kind of really difficult and quite interesting and exciting manufacturing projects. So I worked um, with Zaha I did for a while, um, producing the June formations for David Gill Galleries. Um, and I think at this time it was really interesting just dealing with big manufacturers. So these, these objects here, um, although um, I suppose it's a particular kind of thing. And what was interesting about this was that only car manufacturers could make it. So from coming from product and then into space, then you start to deal with other industries, the automotive industry, also with Mattia Benetti here, designing things that are kind of quite aesthetically particular and quite um, challenging really, I think as a designer, to, to make something like this. Um, but what was fascinating about this is these objects became more than just functional things. What was important was that they had narratives they had other meanings to them. And it was very much about experience, but also about the fantasy of the person that owned it. So you can imagine the person that would own this, you know, 150,000 pound table, cast in bronze in Rome and finished in England. It was crazily expensive, but very particularly it was a show piece. Show piece and it fitted into that whole kind of design art bracket, and which is another kind of particular interesting fusion between art and design. And then working for Fredrickson Stallard here, Although it doesn't look anything particularly um, groundbreaking, it was actually the largest anodized table in Great Britain at the time, um, working with particular manufacturers up in Coventry. So I think also showing you this, it just shows that from doing what you're doing here, whether it's furniture or product or in interiors, um, as you kind of leave college, you apply that design thinking, that knowledge to other kinds of creative projects. So sometimes you might find that you're not necessarily the maker, but you're kind of coordinating, you're using all those design tools that you do very naturally with organising your own projects to organise projects for other people. So after, after that, after kind of doing these gallery pieces and working for Abe, I found myself getting into retail spaces. Now, what was interesting about retail spaces, certainly in London, that's why I just come in, just find a place, maybe down the front here, we need to fill up down here. You're very lucky. <laughs> so, what was interesting about these particular spaces, so maybe I'll hold on a sec for people to sit down. Great, so there's space down the front. <laughs> Everyone's always scared of the front. Are you going to do it? No, second row, okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, so coming back to this, what was interesting about retail environments is all the kind of manufacturing for these spaces, it wasn't, it wasn't through necessarily small design studios, it was, they were going to the film and the pop making industry. So, as a kind of creative, as a creative, as a designer, as an artist, um, you find yourself working with a totally different type of manufacturing process where you're relying on really skilled um, specialists in particular things, so things like making a giant trainer of the size of a car, or you know, making these crazy installations that were very much about filmic experiences. Now this was Nike um, in, on Oxford Street, and Nike were really interesting at the time, and they still are, they still do really interesting exhibitions, they did a really lovely exhibition last year in Milan. Um, <laughs> but it's really about the kind of filmic experience in environments, which I think is becoming increasingly important in retail spaces. And then, um, sort of in my, sort of my time sort of in between all of these things, I was also running a studio with my partner, and we'd focus on particular narrative projects for um, companies like Viewpoint Magazine or the Future Laboratory, so future forecasting magazines. Um, and, and I don't know if you know about Viewpoint, if you don't, do look it up, and the Future Laboratory. Um, they, certainly when they started off, they were kind of groundbreaking in, their, in the way that they tackled trends. And now trends is something that we're all very used to seeing. Um, but these particular articles were just illustrating, so spatial image making, so storytelling through illustration, um, but kind of photographed sets. And then also kind of some installation projects, so this project I did up here with my partner, um, and it was about, um, it was really investigating this idea of, of 
this, uh, this, this thing that we kind of coined of the psychospatial encounter. Philosophers have talked about it, but um, it was very, it's very much about those moments in space where something has a meaning and it kind of confuses you as to what you're looking at. And then perhaps that gives you another sense of something which you hadn't expected. So maybe that plays with your imagination or it makes you think, I don't know, that portals exist or ghosts exist or whatever. But it plays with that kind of insecurity, that fuzzy space between what we know is what really, what really exists and what could do. So that's what the ladder was playing with. Um, that was for an exhibition in Slovenia at the Design Museum a few years ago. Um, now, the tools at the bottom were kind of just a set of tools. So you can see there's lots of different scales of working. And I suppose just showing you my work, it shows that as a designer, I apply it to lots of different things, which I'm sure you will all do if you don't do already. And it's really about design thinking, sort of underlying all of that. That the tools at the bottom were for a, a dinner party, which was an exhibition at Pallant House Gallery in Chichester. And they were, con they were kind of provocations to make people think, notate, write, discuss, kind of creative ideas. Um, and then this project at the end um, was a project that, that we did in response to a particular place in Manchester called Pomona Island. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. It was quite a big project with researchers and students. Um, this was our response. And this was, um, this was really about um, beauty spots. What's a beauty spot? Sometimes you see um, these signs that say Belvedere or beautiful view. Um, and what are those spaces? It seems funny that someone put a sign on something and saying, this is beautiful, have a look at it. You want to come here. Um, so this project was about defining your own beauty spots. So we made these little markers that people could really mark the city, how they want to experience it. So they're not going to the landmarks, they're not following the tourist map, they're looking for what they think is meaningful and then marking that. And then perhaps other people might see them and kind of question the value in what's been kind of highlighted in the city. So, I then found myself at Manchester School of Art. Um, and what was really exciting for me at the time was, um, is really kind of, I suppose, getting under the skin of creative projects. Sometimes commercial projects, although very good, you know, and that's kind of what we all aspire to do, um, sometimes they can all be a bit the same especially when you work for kind of companies and studios, you find yourself working on these big commercial things. And it's the, the exciting stuff that happens in between that I, I really get driven by, I suppose. And working at Manchester sort of gave me the opportunity to work on these kind of interesting research projects. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the art school and the courses, and also, you know, maybe you might like to think about an Erasmus exchange in Manchester. I don't know. Um, it's, we've got a, a brand new building, well it's about four years old now, but what's really interesting is the space is all kind of open, so everyone's sharing big, large open studio spaces. There are kind of small seminar rooms, but you get this really kind of interesting cross-fertilisation with courses, so <coughs> 3D sit next to textiles, fashion set, next, set sit very close to interiors and illustration and graphics, um, and there's a really good collaborative atmosphere in the school. Now Manchester School of Art, um, has been there a long time. It's nearly 180 years it's been in Manchester. Um, Manchester's known for a lot of things. You might know it for football. Um, you might know it for, I mean, it's a, it's a vibrant city. You might know it for its music scene. Um, more recently, it's become the centre of British broadcasting. So the BBC have moved up to Manchester and they created this whole new part of the city called Media City, which is attracting a lot more creative people year on year to the city. Um, so we're the second oldest art school in Britain, and it was originally set up to service the industry, the, the, kind of the start of the Industrial Revolution, which started in Manchester. So I suppose you could talk about the birthplace of the modern world, really starting within quite a small city in the north of England. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about 3D design, specifically. But as we go through, I'll talk to you a little bit about how that crosses over with interiors. I taught in interior design for about four years, and then I've been in 3D as well, teaching across both programmes. So, we call it 3D design, and there's lots of different making courses. 3D design at Manchester is 
essentially a product and a craft course. So it's about sort of product, industrial design perhaps, those kinds of ways of thinking, so thinking like a designer. But then also the craft element is very much about making. Yeah? Within craft, you could be a specialist maker. You could focus on ceramics, metal, wood, glass. Um, or you could think about the combination between the two. And I think that's probably the most interesting part of the course is when those two things meet up. So we designed, so very much looking around the exhibition that I saw this morning, we were all doing very similar things. So, um, so thinking really about the functional, the everyday, um, what's accessible, what's saleable, um, how you can design for kind of small, case, small scale production or even turning that into mass, produ mass production, mass produced objects. Um, some of the objects, so on the left here, that kind of designer maker in the middle, things that are kind of more small scale, perhaps jewellery, things that are designed for intrigue. Oh. <laughs> and then at the end here, objects that are more questioning, things that demand sort of our, our, intent, our, our kind of in attention, ask us to stretch our brains a little bit and try to understand what's going on. Um, so just to kind of show you a few examples, it's a multidisciplinary, multimedia course. So we're working lots of different materials, wood, metal, ceramics, um, experimental materials too. So also kind of doing things in the workshops that we shouldn't necessarily do, um, which doesn't always go down well, but the tutors love it, even if the technical team don't. Um, and then also kind of um, thinking about um, the culture of learning and what it is to become a designer. So how do you move through those workshops? How do you use those things to help either lead your design process or how do you apply your design thinking to making material things? Um, this, this project here just gives you an idea of someone that became very good at extruding ceramics, um, extruding clay, very much kind of like piping icing, um, but produced Maybe it started off as a small scale thing, but then it grew into a larger project. It ended up not being just about wearables for the human, but then also for the home and for space. Um, so these things kind of crossing between what we think is product and then what becomes a product applied to space or experience. Um, then also thinking about particular ways of doing things. So bringing sort of disparate materials together, um, the potential, to, I suppose, to kind of look outside design problems. So things not always being about functional things, but also being about what we might learn through a particular process or, or how we sometimes get surprised when we do strange things with materials. So, so for example, here you've got a tea bag that you can wear, um, a brush and a jug inspired by a builder's yard. So those inspirations some, sometimes come from very different places. And I think actually looking this morning at some of your work, I've seen those same sort of things where you're taking objects from places that you wouldn't necessarily think to look um, for creating particular products. Now also, what I should say about Manchester is we've got really good workshops and really good digital facilities. So, um, but this isn't just for designers, it's also for craft practitioners. So as a designer, you might, um, certainly, certainly interior design at Manchester, we do a lot of laser cutting and some CNC work and you kind of work up digital files and then you get them processed or printed. Um, what's interesting about Manchester is, is when students start to use those digital processes to also kind of develop their craft practice. So whether it's 3D printing something to make a mould that you take into, into kind of small metal work or into ceramics. Now, I put this slide here just so it, it kind of talks about the philosophy of the course. Now, Thomas Heatherwick, over there with his hand on his head, <laughs> must have had a good idea. Um, he's, he came to Manchester, so he's kind of an ex-student of the course. And since Thomas Heatherwick was there in the 90s, I don't think our philosophy has ne necessarily changed that much. Um, it's really about core values, which are about sort of a hands-on approach that explores materials and processes. We challenge what materials and processes are for. We push the boundaries of those materials and processes. But then importantly, I think increasingly now, is we ask, what if? So you question the existing things and our relationships we have to kind of to the made, the made world. And then you ask yourself as a designer, why should things be the way they are? You know, why should a chair be a chair? Why should a table be a chair table? Should we even talk about those things in those terms anymore? Is it relevant? 
Um, just to show you a typical project by a third year student. Um, so, this, so this is a, a student called Joe Hartley. I'm going to talk about him a little bit more later. Um, but what's, what's lovely about this project is it was inspired by bread making, although it doesn't look like um, bread making tools. But all these tools were designed to help you kind of measure dough, to, to be fascinated and learn about bread, but also to learn about bread making through making something else or through using particular devices. Um, and then he went on to think about what you wear, how you kind of transport that, and what it is as kind of a whole holistic experience of, of making bread. Um, and then just some images here just to show you a little bit about what comes out of the workshops, the kind of experimentation with materials, um, our glass workshops, um, also kind of experimenting with unusual materials, um, which I think is probably... I'm sure you guys are doing as well. This particular project here was about using just expanding foam, expanding foam that you use um, on site maybe to fill holes and gaps in walls, but then reappropriating that and making that something to do with the body, changing the scale, making it about kind of wearable things. And what was nice about this student is he, um, he started filling tights with foam, expanding foam, and they became kind of these limbs and these, life, these kind of human-sized things and then kind of chopping them up. So there were lots of nice stories in the, the process that he went about it, which was unusual, but then turning those into something else that you wear that perhaps um, gives you a different sense of what wearables are. Now, this other project um, is more design-related, perhaps. Um, so this was specifically about thinking about local economies. Now, in Wales, in the north of England, well, west of England, well, it's not even England, it's another country, sorry, but if, you've, if you know anyone from Wales, please apologise for me. Um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was about thinking about a particular town that had lost its industry from the mines closing. And this kind of happens all over the world, particular industries close down in towns because it's cheaper to outsource stuff from other countries. And politics got in the way in this case too. But it was thinking about using particular slate from a mine in this particular town and turning that into a product. So the student was thinking about how they could, could kind of, I suppose, remodel and reinvigorate that local economy and create a new industry that's very specific to the location. So she designed um, a set of tools, jugs, tableware that could start kind of a new... Um, cash flow, I suppose, a new kind of opportunity for people that work in that isolated area of Wales. Um, another project which is kind of a sustainability kind of aware project, sustainability is a funny word, I don't really like using it because it has so many different meanings. In this case we're talking about the environment and kind of material responsibility as a designer. And Felix designed, he was, kind of, he was really horrified by <clears throat> the pens that we throw away, the plastic that just gets wasted, particularly big biros. And he designed a sustainably printed pen that you could plant with seeds that became a tree or a plant. But a nice thought about what that kind of device could be and that it was quite useful to be able to just push it into the ground and it could grow into something else. And then this other project around water bottles. So these things, I mean, they're terrible for the environment. They can be recycled. But in developing countries, these are used as building materials. Um, they become bricks um, in particular parts of the world. So Felix was looking at this particular phenomenon and thought, well, how can, how can we make it more useful so that we don't need to put it through another process to turn it into something else? We can just use it as it is. So he 3D printed this bottle as a prototype, but then went to a bottle manufacturer that started to produce this bottle um, in the production, so it was a kind of a real project that ended up having kind of a real benefit. And then sometimes projects can be quite simple. You know, it's not really about making massive things at massive scales, it's really about thinking, just simply thinking. And this project is called Accessible. And it was a student identified that some people haven't got the kind of dexterity with their hands that everyone has, so particularly if you're old or you've got particular disabilities, um, you might not be able to do kind of very normal things. So she looked for opportunities with hacking me every day, using very simple tools that we can all buy and almost putting like an instruction manual together on how you can, you know, solve that problem of not being able to turn the key in the lock because it's too small or finding the correct buttons on the remote control. 
quite mundane things, but then it's all those little things that kind of, kind of build that, that kind of experience of the everyday. All those little frustrations mount to something over time. So by solving these little problems, um, she was proposing that life would get better. Um, and then another type of project. So you can see lots of different types of things going on. And I think what's important about the 3D programme is that students find their path and decide what they want to do. Um, this is really about kind of animation, you know, using materials, using that kind of design thinking, but particularly through narratives. And this student went on to work for McKinnon, McKinnon and Saunders in Manchester, who um, design animations, so they've done a lot of work for Tim Burton on The Corpse Bride, um, Bob the Builder, uh, Pingu, other things like that. But um, some students really kind of find their niche, I suppose, through courses like what you're doing now. And it's about finding a pathway and what really motivates you. So tables often look like this, quite messy, um, but it's all about discovering things, playing, um, and not necessarily about finding solutions all the time. And then sometimes, you know, you have the opportunity to resolve things, and it's more, it's more than just about the finished object, it's about the experience of using it. So um, every year in Manchester, at the end of every year, um, third year students will exhibit at this show called New Designers in London. And that kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting, I don't know if you have anything like that in Portugal, where all the design courses come together and exhibit together in one place. But what's really nice about that is that students studying the same sorts of programmes get to meet each other, they get to network, and they also get to network with kind of industry, sort of visiting, looking for new designers, or um, press that want to talk about their work. Um, if, you have, if you don't know about it, then it might be a nice time to come and visit London in July, early July, and it's at the Business Design Centre in Islington, and you can see lots of students exhibiting their work. Um, this was really talking about where people are going, what people are doing, so I suppose talking again about discipline-specific kind of trajectories, so Jill Shaddock, kind of a, quite, a, quite a well-known ceramicist, Ian McIntyre, who's done some really interesting research projects, doing a PhD now at Manchester, all around ceramics and kind of the heritage um, around Stoke-on-Trent and the, the manufacturing. Felix de Pass, some of these people you might have heard of. Felix de Pass was a product designer, but he's increasingly doing more stuff to do with interiors and installation work. Thomas Heatherwick, you've heard of, I'm sure. Um, and then Ruth Tomlinson, a jewellery designer. Ben Wilson, kind of a general designer. What's really good about Manchester as a city, and you're welcome to come and visit, um, is that it's a very creative place because of all the things that are happening sort of in England at the moment. Um, but also, because the course has been going for such a long time, we have kind of a network there. Um, now, this particular thing called Maker's Dozen is a network of designers that have mostly graduated from the course that organise shows and they support each other. Um, and then they take on projects and they, they kind of have a really good pool of kind of um, specialists to pull into those things. So, for example, in this project, the Pilcrow Pub, Joe Hartley, who graduated from the course a few years ago, pulled together his contacts and he worked with the co-op. The co-op commissioned Joe and a, a few other people to rethink the local British pub and what that should be in the heart of this new community in Manchester, this new part of Manchester, this new district called Noma, which were these kind of old derelict buildings. And they're, they're renovating them and rethinking the area. But they wanted to be able to create somewhere where people could go and people could start to build a community around a very British thing, the British pub. So Joe and his other two friends started to link into this network and they started to run community kind of projects where um, they'd invite anyone to come and design chairs for the day or to design um, particular things for the bar or to design the pub itself. So this pub is all built by hand from scratch through community workshops and it went on for about a year. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how research um, informs what we do in terms of teaching. So students do research all the time. You're all doing research with your, with your project work. But what I think 
um, it's really interesting is when tutors research and other academics and professors, when that starts to feed into what you're, what you're learning and what you're doing. Um, now this started actually, um, you might recognise some people in this image. This started a few years ago, um, actually was, I think it was, 20, it was 2012, and the interior design course at Manchester came to Lisbon for a week. And we ran a two-day workshop with Pedro and Rita. Um, I don't know if you guys know, will they know Pedro and Rita? Some of them. Um, and, um, and, we did, and we did this kind of collaborative workshop for two days from, with students from interior design. Um, and what we did was, we, it was for Experimenter, okay, the design biennale in Lisbon. Um, things have changed a little bit recently, but Experimenter had this lovely old courthouse building in the centre with this space called the lounging space, and it was the centre kind of for the week, for the, for the festival. And over two days, Manchester students and students from here um, were put into different rooms in mixed groups and they were given themes and they had to think about the kind of context of the courtroom, they had to think about the types of people that might visit the exhibition, they had to think about the theme of the exhibition which was useless, okay, and what useless was, and when, do things, when are things really useless and if you try to create useless, does it end up not being useless because you created something that's actually useful. So kind of playing with all those really interesting um, discussions and then also scavenging material for this, from this really lovely old courthouse building which has kind of just been left um, for years with kind of lovely diaries of people that have been put in prison, maybe not so lovely, um, but then uh, really nice stories and then finding kind of desks from, from people that used to work in the courthouse with kind of like a, maybe some liqueur or some kind of whiskey or something in a drawer. Um, but some nice interesting stories. So the students took all of that and they started to create these installations. Um, so you can see a few images here. It's just a very quick workshop over a couple of days using what was there. Now that kind of, that kind of inspired us. And when we returned to Manchester we started using this kind of idea of collaboration for a project that we run every year called Unit X. And that runs all the way across the art school between all the different particular specialisms. So every year at different levels we'll do different kinds of projects. So say for example first year interior design might, might work with 3D in collaborative groups or with illustration or with graphics. Um, or we might just open up a project and invite anyone to come and join it. <clears throat> so we started doing that with um, NOMA, that area of Manchester that I talked about. Um, and it was for a festival, actually there were two parts of this. The first part was the festival called Future Everything, which was a digital media festival. And the second part was for this national um, event in the UK called Museums Open Late, or Northern Quarter After Dark, as it was in Manchester. And Future Everything had this particular idea of using these derelict spaces for pop-up exhibitions. So the BBC had one building, um, another group had another, another group had another building. And the job for the students was to um, basically work out all the wayfinding and the signs and the direction and, and create interventions between all these entrances so people knew that they were entering a particular type of space. So you can see here that the BBC was running an exhibition on future technologies. Um, in the Hanover building, people were exhibiting ideas of the future of war and defence. Um, Federation House was about factory and production. Um, so really kind of, I suppose, future thinking applications for designers. Um, so to kickstart the project we did these, these sensory workshops so um, students learned a little bit about technology using something called the Makey Makey. Um, I don't know if you've used that or things like Arduinos but really thinking about animating objects or animating spaces. Um, we did particular workshops in smell so thinking about sound, taste, maybe sight through projection, projection mapping. So also integrating technology into the making process. And then also thinking about the sixth sense. So how do people make sense of it all? Yeah, what's their primer, if you like? What's their background? I'll talk a bit about that in a, in a moment. So these workshops are quite interesting. So Lewis in the top left, you can't really see properly, but he just gathered everyone together in a room. And Lewis is a sound designer um, and an artist. 
And um, he asked students to develop a particular kind of call, a call to the wild, a mating call, if you like. And then people had to try and find each other blindfolded in this room. But it was interesting, I suppose, relating to other people just through sound, um, without seeing, without kind of all those other kind of sensory um, experiences. We also got people like Neil Harbison in to talk about this relationship between colour and sound. If you haven't, if you don't know about Neil Harbison, have a look on the TED Talks. He does a really lovely lecture on, on sound and colour. And um, Neil Harbison, do, who knows about Neil Harbison? Put your hand up. Oh, okay. Neil Harbison, right, really interesting guy. He's a musician, but he's colour blind. Okay, and he really wanted to be able to experience colour. Um, so he decided to become a cyborg and he got a little device drilled into his brain with this kind of antenna that comes over the top of his head and it's a camera in front of him. So now when he walks around, the camera picks up all the different colours um, in the spectrum and it plays it to him as sound um, to his brain. So he can now sense colour like everyone else, which is why he dresses so, um, so, colour, so in such a colourful way, although he's colour blind, because he sees colour as kind of cadences. So when he walks into an environment, he hears it. He hears particular people that he's talking to by what they're wearing. So he kind of says that people that dress all in one colour sound really awful. But it's interesting that, um, that, kind of, that kind of difference of experience and he can also hear things, or he can sense things like ultraviolet and um, infrared. Um, so we kind of feed the students all this inspiration and hope they're going to do something really good with it, and they often do. And um, this was kind of presenting ideas to future everything, to get the go-ahead to do stuff in spaces, kind of working on installation projects over a couple of weeks. It was only a four-week project. Um, so working with the technical team to make things happen. And then particular installations. So this, this was going down to kind of the Future of Food exhibition. And the students did something quite interesting with using an Arduino and fruit. And they programmed this wall so that you could touch two different types of fruit. And the Arduino would um, basically process it so that you had the kind of new version of that fruit if it was genetically modified in a projection in front of you. It's just a bit of fun, and it's to kind of get people thinking before they enter the exhibition, which was kind of mostly scientists showing their kind of, their new kind of research projects. And then sort of a very simple installation going down the stairs, where it was about germs spreading and thinking about what we touch and residues and maybe other people that we get on us in a day because we touched particular things. So they, they very simply um, just lined the kind of, the, uh, the banister of the escalator with like a UV dust. So that as people went down into the exhibition and they started to touch things, we could tell where everyone had been. And then the second part of the project was to do installations in the Northern Quarter. So this was particularly interior design students, actually. It was first year interiors and um, third year um, film and media production students. The, the film and media production students were the project managers and the first years were really learning, I suppose, in this project about, um, they were learning about how to be professionals, how to work out there in first year with a client, how briefs sometimes don't go the way you want, sometimes you have to convince people that you are right and they're not. And in this particular case, actually back here, the, the project at the bottom, it was this really famous bar in Manchester called Dry Bar, really big in the 90s. 80s and 90s in the Manchester music scene um, and they had this, the, the, the owner of the bar wanted them to kind of show the history of the bar over those decades um, and he was a really tough client. He wasn't standing for any of it, he knew exactly what he wanted to do but actually he didn't get anything of what he wanted. He actually got um, rightly what the designer's vision was but as being a designer it's really how you convince, how you tell your story, um, how you make people see what's in your mind um, which is really difficult, but a really good experience through doing this kind of project. So, um, the following year, we decided we wanted to collaborate with different kind of, um, different types of people, different types of students. So we did this project, I'm going to play a little music here. Um, we did this project with the Royal Northern College of Music, which is just next door to the art school. 
Now what was really nice about this is we were taking first year interior design students um, and MA um, kind of cross-discipline students, mostly based around media and projection mapping and kind of technology-based um, creative kind of interpretations of projects. And then also um, we were working with opera students, so students that sung opera. Um, and what was really lovely about this was the performance, the exhibition, you could really see these different specialisms. So those that were making, those that were doing installing, and then those that were kind of performing as performing artists. So I'll just play you this film, um, which gives you a little bit of a better idea of the project. It started with um, me talking to Stefan, who's the director of Opera, and uh, we, ha we had a cup of coffee together in the cafe in the School of Art, and uh, we started chatting about the fact that the two buildings are right beside each other, and that we should really be doing some collaboration together, and um, that's how it started. <laughs> rated unit of study in the School of Arts which is, is across all programmes and the it means that it's a quarter of the students here. It's completely focused on professionalism and getting the students to work with external partners to, to kind of get into the real world. So they work on projects with um, other students from other courses and they work with somebody else in the city or perhaps even internationally. that we are in the 21st century and also now that the technology is a lot more flexible to engage with the artists who can bring so much more visual depth to the emotional journey of the concert experience. Probably the most memorable thing uh, was actually right at the beginning when I went to the original meeting and I was really interested to see how much what they can actually do um, with the kind of graphics and the um, lighting and uh, I didn't quite realise the scope of what was going to happen um, and it was really exciting to know that I was going to be involved in something like that. In this case interior design was, uh, was collaborating with creative multimedia um, um, Due to the kind of nature of the songs, we thought it would be beautiful to have those, those songs staged in the city in different spaces. Um, certainly with the Vaughan Williams, with the songs of travel, and it being all about travel, we decided it would be great to do something with Transport for Greater Manchester on the tram network. Um, and then the other pieces would be great to, to stage those um, in Federation House, up in the Northern Quarter, as part of an art school show. It's really an incredibly welcome thing to engage with. And the master's degree students were incredibly imaginative and thoughtful and respectful. Incredibly impressive how they responded to what they perceived as our world. The students that are working from the postgraduate side are working on a unit that we call professional platforms. It's very similar to Unidex, but it's grown out of um, postgraduates being required to set themselves in a place that deals with external live experiential learning, um, very much on a pro professional level. <laughs> This project started a few months ago with an invitation uh, to come and speak to a large collection of art students at MMU to talk to them about site-specific theatre or about the dialogue between design and the public and performance and how those kind of those worlds can combine. The change um, in, in both groups of students we've worked in from the energy of ideas to the actual, the finished result and, and, and 
that you know making making things come to life in a practical sense and the transition particularly with the MA team of of having this maybe not um, constraint almost of, of the story of, of the music and of the songs you know and actually they, them on coming in on that process of actually getting their language from you know from creating a piece of theatre I suppose. I think I've uh, enabled the students to use different live software to place video in places that they wanted to put it and to be able to control that in a live setting. <laughs> concert hall with all of these great big monstrous kind of component parts like a full orchestra and loads of kind of grey singers making lots of noise. <laughs> now, um, so, right, lots of different types of, um, I suppose, lots of different ways of thinking about, the, well, like I said before, the experience of how, um, how we design particular scenarios and situations, um, the ways in which we live in these particular environments, and the way that we kind of entertain ourselves and work with other kind of professionals. But anyway, um, now the Life Research Group is the kind of next kind of, um, I suppose, development of these types of projects. Now, it's a cross-faculty research group. Um, I was going to play a little video, but I think I'll skip that. Um, and we started to, as researchers, so Manchester Metropolitan University, right? Manchester School of Art sits within the bigger university, and as part of the university, you've got all sorts of different faculties. You've got science and the environment, science and engineering, you've got psychology, you've got humanities, so you've got creative writing courses, language courses. Now, all of those kind of disciplines, they all have particular research interests. And what's really interesting, I think, for art and design is when you start to talk to those different people. So you start to talk to psychologists or kind of environmental artists or you talk to um, neuroscientists um, about projects that you want to tackle, like this place, Pomona Island. Now, I mean, this, this was kind of a focus for the research group. Um, and Pomona Island's this kind of really lovely space. I think it's lovely. Other people might think it's a waste of space. Um, but it's this kind of residual space, sort of in, it's just off the centre of Manchester. It's kind of the last place to be developed within the city. And what's interesting about it is it has just been forgotten. It's been waiting for a particular time, a moment in time. And that moment's now. They're starting to develop it. But I think what's interesting about this is we're kind of trying to intervene as researchers and kind of with the students to really think about what that should really be and whether that should be just an extension of this kind of consumer city. Um, so Pomona Island was part of Salford Docks. It's got this really great history where all the boats used to come from Liverpool into Manchester city centre um, to unload for the cotton trade, for the Industrial Revolution. It was a really important part of the city. And then, sort of early 1800s, there was this big palace built called, and it's part of Pomona Pleasure Gardens. And it was the biggest <coughs> building at the time, sort of in the early 1800s. It held 20,000 people and they used to have um, political rallies there. And then this kind of gas explosion happened and it destroyed the building. And then it kind of, it had different uses over, over time. Um, but it was largely forgotten and kind of just, just kind of left. Um, to, to kind of do what it does and just be this kind of wasteland. Now it is owned by someone, this particular developer called Peel Holdings, and this is, this is Peel's plan for the site, um, these kind of, these flats, which don't look great. Um, and then this is us kind of exploring. Now I'm going to play you another little film which is just going to tell you a little bit about the history of Pomona. And in this film you'll get to meet a few of the people that got involved in the project. It's kind of all the things that rural life breeds, but it's in the middle of a city almost, and that was part of the reason for its success historically, was that 
it was right near a city centre, it was somewhere to come and enjoy and now it's kind of like a secret place to come and enjoy where life has thrived despite the city. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, it was a huge pleasure garden. Um, it was full of kind of shooting ranges, as archery here and mazes, and um, a camera obscura as well. And some years after that, they built a palace for 20,000 people. It was a huge tourist attraction. So I'd like to, to bring people here to show them that this was a, an important historical site. I, I know this area quite well, so um, translating it into you know someone who's not been here before, it, it is uh, you know it is, it is quite I think even confusing for people. I would say the history of Salford Docks has not really gone mainstream. It's not shouted about. It's not promoted heavily. It, it's, there's a lot to it, even though it just looks like a bit of a bit of waste ground. I'd say it's, it's a you know it's a paradise. It, it really is. It really is a paradise. It's a, a, a sort of green oasis right in the middle of uh, in the middle of uh, you know Manchester, uh, Trafford. It's it's an urban oasis if you if you like. So that gives you kind of a, a flavour of what this space is. Um, James, the guy that was talking there, he's a bird watcher, um, but he's, um, so he spends a lot of time on Pomona looking at birds. Um, but uh, his, his family are, are kind of Salford dockers. They go really way back until, even back to when they built the canals. Um, his family have always lived in Salford. So he's got this really close relationship with that particular place. And I think that's important when we think about city development. Anyway. Um, so what we decided to do as groups of researchers was work with MA students, so master's level students, and um, basically put on an exhibition, but that exhibition was a walk. And the idea was that students would think about Pomona, the situation, what it should be within a city, you know, what do we really want it to be? Um, and then it kind of, I suppose, explore and discuss and present those ideas through a walk. Now the walk's a really interesting medium, okay, so this idea of you could say, so you probably heard about a derive or this kind of serendipitous experience of the city where maybe you haven't got a particular defined route, but you kind of experience things, you meet people, you let the route kind of present ideas. And that was the idea for this project, that where people would come on the walk and they would experience these different voices, these different stories for the city. It was part of, we did this exhibition as part of um, Manchester European City of Science. Um, which was great. We did it just after Brexit, so we felt very European. Um, but it was an interesting moment because people were very uncertain. They were talking about Europe and, and then this particular science festival in Manchester. Um, so we were also talking about that kind of situation as well and being on an island. Um, so Pomona is an island, but anyway, Pomona encounters so some images from the walk. So you can see students presenting work along the walk um, and really talking about this idea of the future city. And then we decided afterwards to kind of consolidate that and put it in a book. Now we worked with a publisher called Gaia Project and what's really good I suppose about doing this, which we kind of found out through doing it, is that I suppose researchers at the university were publishing work with students, um, which was then kind of showcased later for a design, design event. Um, so from that, so we had the walk, we did this work with the researchers and the MA students, and then we decided we'd run a two-day workshop with another institution from the Netherlands for Design Manchester, which is um, it's a festival that happens every year in Manchester in October time. And we kind of set this brief for second-year students. So it was second-year 3D design, um, also MA landscape architecture students, and then we had the product design students from Artes Art Institute in Arnhem in the Netherlands that came over on a study trip. And we just did a two-day workshop, again, um, 
And what was important about this is because we're all makers, the landscape students were really kind of there, a kind of a, a kind of more advanced level, thinking about the nature of the city and the kind of realities in planning, I suppose. And then all the making students were thinking about through making, how do we tell stories? Okay, in the workshop, we did like a scavenging event where we all went onto Pomona, we picked things up, we tried to, we tried to dissect the history, what we thought was important. Then through brainstorming and making in a workshop down the road, trying to translate these ideas into physical things that people could be presented with and then hopefully understand a little bit about, you know, the future or the possible futures for that particular part of the city. Now, it's quite, it's quite a strange concept thinking about city planning and landscape and then thinking about, as a product designer, how do you respond to that? You know, how do you make people think about nature? How do you make people think about other things beyond just commercially kind of being interested in the everyday? Now, what we, we kind of phrased this, um, we phrased these instruments that the students were making as, um, we called them apiso instruments. I don't know if anyone knows ancient Greek. I, don't, I probably haven't pronounced that right at all. But apiso is this kind of ancient Greek um, idea about the future, right? So a piece of kind of, is this kind of meaning where um, the future's behind you, you can't see it, yeah? And to get to the future, you have to walk backwards. So everything that you understand and see is in front of you. And as you walk backwards, the future starts to become visible and it starts to move into the past. But I think it's, it gives a nice clarity about how we experience things, how our vision, we don't really know what's, what's there. We kind of create it and you kind of, make things happen as you move backwards into this thing that you can't see. Um, I'll play this little film, it's not long. Student project led by a program leader of 3D, Fabrizio, who is on Pomona Island, which is an undeveloped, untamed site in the centre of Manchester. So students from Manchester School of Art and Art EZ Institute of Arts in the Netherlands they are there now. They are exploring ways they can design new methods of living in response to this very raw place. So the Pomona Island um, Design Lab project runs in parallel to the symposium and it's a two-day project which investigates themes of thinking about the future of our city in relation to Pomona Island or using Pomona Island as a starting point to initiate kind of design thinking. What is the interesting part is when you come together as two schools from two different countries that you start looking at what is uh, a designer, what is the future of design, what is the landscape where design fits in and then with the symposium and also the Pomona Island and the design lab you really start researching on how can we create a new generation of designers, what kind of tools do they need, what kind of methods do they need, and on Pomona was the perfect exploring ground to uh, harvest new ideas, to learn to collaborate, and also understand the cultural differences and realize we're actually not that different. Yeah, that's really important, this kind of project, isn't it? That yeah. it is all those different disciplines coming together, yeah. because everyone's got a different perspective yeah. on what we're dealing with in the city, and if the city's just planned by architects and designers, yeah. then it can never really address all those yeah. issues yeah. so you need to deal with the community and you need to talk to specialists yeah. so that you can be really informed with what your your thinking is right so just moving on so from the the kind of workshop we exhibit it as part of design manchester so we launched the book then too um, and it was just a really good opportunity really for well i mean we called this exhibition a salon Right, and the interesting thing about framing it as something apart from an exhibition, we, we did it at the Pilcrow pub, this place that I told you about that Joe Hartley had built. Joe was involved in the workshops too. Um, but it was a very informal gathering and it was more about meeting, discussing, having a drink, having some food and really talking to lots of different types of people. So we invited the local council, we invited city planners, we invited people that kind of had interest in the site, the local community, and we had a discussion. And actually from those very sort of simple things, not really knowing, you know, this idea of walking backwards into the future, not knowing where it's going, we've actually opened up the door with a developer to be actually able to do something with the site. I'll just play you another quick short film. Um, ignore me in it, again, talking. <laughs> but you'll get to meet other people that were involved in the project in this little film that have something very important to say. I can play it. Oh. 
the collected works of 32 authors, bound together in a book about a forgotten island. Fruitful Futures is the collected thoughts of some of the city's prominent activists, urbanists, wildlife experts on the abandoned land known as Pomona Island in Trafford. Pomona, as many know, is undergoing some development at the moment and um, it was really an opportunity to think about that kind of space within cities and how we should be maybe valuing it differently and not just producing the same sorts of housing that we are and the same sorts of kind of city formats. It's really thinking about what Pomona should be. So we invited the MA students to write for the book. We also invited researchers and the Pomona community that have been working over the last 10 years documenting bird migrations, documenting the ecology, who really know what Pomona is about. Pomona Island is set to be developed into residential and leisure property, despite the protestations of nature experts. I'd say Pomona Island is an essential opportunity for Manchester to ground itself as a progressive city, really looking to the future and committing Manchester to not only raising awareness and educating people about the importance of green space, but also putting Manchester on an international platform and saying, you know, this is what we can do with brownfield sites, this is what brownfield sites have the potential to become. Wildlife needs a network of habitats. Uh, you know, you might go there and you might see not a lot, but it doesn't mean that the next day there's not going to be loads of wildlife there. Uh, at the moment, there's auto migration, there's like thousands of birds moving along. They come uh, from sort of Scandinavia, Scotland, and they're moving like through the, the north of England. They follow the River Air. Well, you get up very early in the morning, you can see hundreds of birds migrating through Pomona. Though the city faces a growing housing crisis, the conflict between campaigner and developer has led to a piece of literature that will push the conversation around construction on brownfield sites in Greater Manchester. It was created as a collective, so it wasn't, there weren't different levels of people working, some more important people, some less important people, but everybody was, uh, was equal which sometimes doesn't happen in academia and it doesn't happen in life in general. So it's really nice to have something that is more democratic, that everybody was having a similar input. Pomona, uh, strangely enough, has become like um, a symbol of um, the way in which society is moving. Um, it's become uh, a political uh, hot potato. It's become uh, a confrontational place. Um, it's become a place for wildlife and nature, or symbolising wildlife and nature, I should say. Um, and also it's become a place where we can start to resolve these issues, rather than just becoming confrontational things, but actually a place where developers and people who are keen in developing different lifestyles can come together and actually discuss things. Trafford Council, nor Peel Holdings, responded when approached for a statement. Alec Heron, that's Manchester. Right, so just to round up, I realise I'm going a bit over. So the Life Research Group from that project is developing other things. Um, so we're, we're currently kind of we're working on a project which will feed into the education in September time um, with this company, this, this organisation called Incredible Edible in Todmorden. They're worth looking up. They've got like a global network now. They've been going about 10 years. And it was just started by these two people, Mary Claire and um, Pam uh, Warhurst in this little town in north in in kind of West Yorkshire called Todmorden, and basically Pam and Mary just noticed all these kind of unused bits of land around the town, and they decided, well, why don't we plant vegetables? So they just adopted all these kind of vacant spaces, and they started kind of these city these kind of town centre allotments, invited people to join them with growing. So they basically created a growing movement where people could come and harvest. Um, for free, could come and harvest. They can, they can come in in the evening at the station, they can pick some herbs or some vegetables to cook for dinner. Very simple, but what they noticed was the kind of mentality in the town started to change. Crime started to go down, people started to behave differently, people started to take pride in where they lived. So a really nice little project, and we're going to work with them in September time, thinking about the future of food production um, and how things are changing sort of globally with these issues. Also working with people like Vincent Walsh, who kind of overtook this, this kind of derelict building in the centre of Salford. But Vincent's research, or his recent PhD, is all about agroforestry. So a different way of growing, thinking about systems and, and cycles 
Um, but then also design's really relevant to this because that helps kind of make all of this possible. And then also thinking about waste, a really important topic, working with the RSA, the Royal Society of um, Arts, essentially. Um, but they did a really interesting report over the last four years called The Great Recovery. And it was basically linking designers with manufacturing um, companies and thinking about waste streams. So we're going to run another project quite soon about that. Now, what, what's really important, I think, with all of this, right? and I joked earlier talking about the five senses and then the sixth sense, OK? Um, but when, when you're dealing with these kinds of things and you're starting to change the way people think and the way people live, um, and you're trying to change lifestyles, perhaps, OK? Maybe only just simply. Um, you really need to think about the motivations people have. How do you really stop people making waste? You can talk about recycling, but most people switch off. You know, so how do you make it relevant to them? So how can you talk these, the same language as everyone, which is really difficult. As, but you know, certainly when you're thinking about politics, there's so many different points of view. How do you talk to everyone? Or is it important to talk to everyone? Um, so I think design's got this really interesting opportunity here where we can you know, start to sort of drip feed ideas, start to really manufacture a new way of living. Um, and I suppose it's important to find that glue that connects people. How do people understand each other? You know, how do people understand the physical world? I said a little earlier um, about people being on different pages. You know, people, that's, that's an English phrase. It means you're on a different page. You're not reading the same thing, essentially. You know, you, you've got different motivations. Um, I think... So, really, what I'm getting into here is, if we investigate imagination, right, creativity, fear, motivation, and reality, right, as kind of underlying threads with all of what we do, um, investigating something like the paranormal doesn't seem so bonkers. Um, and we do have a little splinter group from the Life Research Group, which is called Atmospheric Facility, and it is about investigating the paranormal. Now, paranormal, not in a sense of ghosts and ghouls and things like that, it's with the psychology department, and they run a particular course in the paranormal. And paranormal, broken down, just simply means power out of, the or so out of, sort of alongside, and normal, the normal everyday things, I suppose you could think. So things that are outside of our normal understanding. So we meet once a month on a full moon. We go and investigate old derelict buildings with particular devices and try and, and, try and measure kind of air currents and heat changes and ultrasound. Um, but then we also talk about kind of um, sort of very everyday things and how we kind of understand our environments. How, do our, how does our technology, how do our environments, our furniture, our products talk to us in ways that we can't necessarily sense? Um, and all of that's quite important, I think, when you think about a holistic interpretation or a holistic understanding of how you design and why you design. Um, so... Lots of different things to think about. This is the, um, the 3D design blog. If you want to have a look at what we're doing, please do. We're also on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and then also, please visit the Manchester School of Art website and have a look at both interior design and 3D design. Um, that's it. I hope that's been interesting. Thank you.